Thanks for joining us uh, this Sunday morning. Uh, David Ketchum and I host a Zoom meeting at 4 p.m. every Sunday to discuss, hopefully, the, the sermon topic of the day. Uh, you'll find the Zoom link on our uh, Facebook page for Community Christian Church and for the Emerging Church on my personal Facebook page. David virtually never posts anything on his Facebook page and is therefore probably not much help. But where you find the sermon link, I will try to be sure that I always add the uh, Zoom link. But if you're the sort of person that wants to join us on Sundays at 4 regularly, it's the same link. So if you just copy it into your calendar, you'll get a reminder. And we always enjoy visiting with our extended family. Now about today. Because some ancient cave paintings seem to use recognizable images of people and animals to tell a story, anthropologists are in general agreement that humans developed spoken language around 35,000 years ago. However, written language only appeared about 5,500 years ago in Sumer in what is modern-day Iran. So there's about 30,000 years of songs, poems, possibly some of our very best mother-in-law jokes that are now lost to us because no one could write them down. The oldest piece of literature is about 4,000 years old. Once it moved past Abraham owes me 12 shocks of, of wheat and got into actual storytelling, the oldest one we have is an epic poem based on the rather fantastic accounts attributed to the ancient king of the city of Uruk, Gilgamesh. We believe he's depicted in this relief as being the master of animals, holding a male lion under his left arm and a serpent in his right hand. Gilgamesh might have been an actual historical person, but the telling and retelling of stories of his great strength and his superhuman prowess gets inflated and inflated until, as you can see in this image, from the size of the grown male lion under his left arm, Gilgamesh would have certainly dominated the ancient Akkadian basketball courts at a height of between 18 to 20 feet. The modern era rediscovered the Gilgamesh epic in the 1850s. And what interested modern readers the most was a fragment of the novella that was shockingly similar to the story in Genesis about Noah. This story, written thousands of years before the book of Genesis, talks about a fellow named Utnapishtim who was conscripted by the gods to build a huge boat prior to a divinely inspired flood and to collect two of every kind of animal in order to save people and animal life from the flood. There are differences in the Genesis account uh, of Noah and the Babylonian account of Utnapishtim, but the similarities were such that, you know, it kept adult Sunday school classes in the throes of a kind of irrational panic as, as they were forced to wonder whether or not God really wrote the Bible or if it just might be a collection of ancient stories and sermons. Of course, both the story of Utnapishtim and the story of Noah are likely to have been oral tradition myths for many years before either of them were written down as just part of a longer narrative. They were preserved, thankfully, in those narratives so that we can read them today and compare them to each other. But of course, neither are historical and Sadly enough, neither were written by God. And it is evident for a number of reasons that I'm just not going to bore you with now that the Babylonian version is two to 3,000 years older than the Genesis version. So we can pretty confidently say that there was some Hebrew priest in captivity in Babylon who is still awaiting trial for obvious plagiarism. But all levity aside, the reason I bring this up today is to take note of the fact that at the very dawn of civilization, when our ancient ancestors 
we're moving from consciousness to self-consciousness as they begin to grapple with the meaning of their life, their existence. The first issue that was treated uh, at any length was the horrifying awareness that we are all mortal and that one day we are all going to die. In the Gilgamesh epic, the hero of the story had become so very strong and, honestly, so sexually exploitative that the people of Uruk appealed to the gods for a champion who would somehow challenge Gilgamesh since none of them could stand up to him. So the gods sent them a wild man, Enkidu, who was, at least initially, more of a problem than Gilgamesh because he was more wild animal than human. He didn't speak. He didn't wear clothes. He couldn't be restrained. He couldn't be held by ropes or chains. And again, without going into too much detail, Gilgamesh comes up with the bright idea of sending the town prostitute out to deal with Enkidu, and the people of the village come out the next day and find him seated, fully clothed, speaking fluently, and well-mannered. The epic does not say what she did to tame him, nor will I speculate about that at this point. The larger issue is that Enkidu and Gilgamesh then become very close friends, and they set out on all of these heroic quests and feats of superhuman strength. The gods eventually take offense at their arrogance, and they cause Enkidu to die a slow and painful death. The mortality of Enkidu comes as a shock to Gilgamesh. The text says that he held on to his body for six nights and seven days until a maggot fell from his nose, a symptom universally understood to mean that he was not merely dead, but that he was really quite sincerely dead. It is at this moment that Gilgamesh becomes obsessed with an awareness that He's going to die too. And so he sets out to try to find the secret to eternal life. Now, religion is full of promises of life after death, assurances of the reality of heaven or of hell. But in this most ancient piece of what we can think of as religious philosophy, the conclusion is that while there are hints and hopes for life after death, it ultimately either doesn't exist at all or it is entirely unattainable. Now, that's probably not what you want to hear, but I have to tell you, I recently listened to a sermon from the famous preacher at the megachurch in California. I don't want to tell you specifically that it was the Saddleback Baptist Church where Rick Warren teaches, but Rick Warren was talking about mortality, but he was assuring what, according to the YouTube counter says was more than 4 million listeners that your death is just a transition into a new and better life, that God loves you and loves you uh, so much that God created you to become a member of God's family, but you weren't ready to be born into that family. You had to go through some travail, some learning in this life to get ready for glory. Of course, many of you have tried to rein in my criticisms of fundamentalist preachers in the past, reminding me he has his opinion, you have your opinion, and everyone has a right to their own beliefs, their own religion, and no one is better than another. I get it. You would like for me to be more diplomatic. And you know, honestly, sometimes I would like for me to be more diplomatic. But if everyone's opinion is of equal value, why do people continue to choose to have a board-certified neurosurgeon do their brain surgery rather than the guy who mows their lawn? The guy who mows their lawn might be a better neurosurgeon than the person with all the fancy degrees and certifications at the hospital. He could be. He might be. But we all know that he probably isn't. In fact, It is darn near impossible to even imagine that the guy that's mowing your lawn, unless he's a retired neurosurgeon, could possibly perform brain surgery. 
Now, what I would like to say about Rick Warren's one hour and 14 minute long sermon, something else you can be thankful for if you think about it, is that he did not say one thing in an hour and 14 minutes that he could support with the tiniest bit of evidence, not a scrap. There is no more reason to believe anything that he said about heaven than there is to believe in fire-breathing dragons or unicorns or that Donald Trump will be reinstated as president sometime this month. I don't want to tell you that absolutely everything that this bloviating corpulent cleric says is nothing but balloon juice, but the only reason that I would not assure you that there is no credible content to anything he says is just because he is saying more or less the same thing that my Sunday school teachers told me and that yours probably told you and that millions of other preachers are either directly saying or they are at least implying, and in mainstream churches with ministers who are actually educated, they just let you believe this nonsense and never say anything to challenge you, to correct you, to teach you, or to lead you into the level of critical thinking that ancient people in Sumer did 4,000 years ago when they read the Gilgamesh epic. The educated clergy know better, but they don't want to upset you. They don't want to disappoint you. They don't want to alienate you. They don't want to take away your security blanket. Or maybe they don't want you to take away their security blanket in the form of their salary and their pension fund. By the way, Rick Warren is not the richest evangelical pastor in the country, but his net worth is over $25 million, which is about 100 times more than my net worth, and yet you can depend on me to tell you the truth and back it up with scientific research. I'm not sure when I turned left when I should have turned right, but it certainly worked out for him financially. Now, sure, he could be right about eternal life. But if he is, this chowhound better hope that only humans go to heaven because if cows, pigs, chicken, and fish also have souls and eternal life, this guy better find a place to hide as soon as he gets through the pearly gates. <laughs> Why, when there is absolutely no evidence for life after death for fish, chickens, cows, pigs, or people, are millions of people willing to make an obvious fraud into a multi-millionaire who is peddling balloon juice. But if you look up that sermon, and I've got the link in the text of this message, if you ever want to see the manuscript of the sermons that David and I deliver, just go to our church website and click on the sermon tab, and we've got hundreds of manuscripts there. I'm sure the cure for insomnia is in one of them. But if you... Scroll down in this sermon, you can click on that link and then see the comments where thousands of jubilant people enthusiastically say that this is the best sermon they've ever heard. Why? When it is obviously pure baloney. Why would so many people applaud while they're being fleeced by a con man? And it is simply this. They want to believe it. They believe it because they want to believe it. You know, when I was five years old, I caused a controversy in my kindergarten Sunday school class when I just blurted out early in December that Santa Claus was not real. <laughs> I told my classmates that I'd seen lots of deer over at Mammoth Cave National Park in Kentucky, and they cannot fly, and that no one person could visit every house in the world in a single day, even if they could wiggle down chimneys, which you can't. My brother, who was a couple of years older, heard about the controversy, cornered me in the hallway, and demanded that I act like I believe in Santa, because if I didn't, we wouldn't get as many presents. <laughs> My parents conspired to lie to us about St. Nick, and we conspired to pretend to believe the myths so that we might get an extra present on Christmas morning. In religion, people pretend to believe in things, that are obviously not true. 
and they get something out of the exchange. And part of what they get is the ultimate whistling through the graveyard. Belief in an afterlife can comfort us a little bit in our grief, giving us some thin hope that maybe death isn't final and that someone we love very much will be restored to us in some other existence when we have joined them in death. Belief in an afterlife can assuage our own fears of our mortality, what hit Gilgamesh as he looked at the maggot dropping from Enkidu's nose is that this is going to happen to me too. Belief in an afterlife allows us to narcissistically assure ourselves that we are, quite frankly, too important for the universe to dare trying to go on existing without us. And belief in an afterlife can give you some sense that there is a cosmic balancing of the scales of justice. I love a story that the late uh, Texas Governor Ann Richards tells about one of her political friends who lived next door to a neighbor with whom she had a decades-long battle about right-of-way, about how she had to cross the neighbor's land to get access to her land, and there were lawsuits and fights and whatever. But in a chance meeting years later, Ann Richards saw the lady and asked her how things turned out with that pesky neighbor. And she said, oh, that woman, that woman done died and gone to hell. <laughs> The ancient Persian slaves who invented the concept of hell for about the same reason that I don't own a gun. When my father died, my older brother asked me if I wanted any of dad's guns. And when he made that offer, I immediately started thinking of all the people that I know who really deserve to be shot. And so I told my brother that I just didn't think it was a good idea for me to own a gun. The Persian slaves, who had been so sorely mistreated by their masters, felt that they needed a hell because so many people deserve to go there. And I understand that sentiment. Really, I do. But just because there ought to be a hell doesn't mean there is one. Just because we would feel better about mortality if we could believe we were going to go to heaven, that doesn't mean there is one. My daughter is visiting this week, and we found ourselves at an impasse talking about people that we know who have not yet had the COVID-19 vaccine. She insists that she knows good people who are very intelligent who just don't think it's a good idea. I, on the other hand, have become very comfortable with the binary choice that given the amount of information that we've all been exposed to over the past year, both about the virus and the vaccines, that there are only two plausible reasons why someone in the United States would not be vaccinated, other than those that are too young or those who have some rare medical condition that might make it dangerous. What remains is you're either too stupid to understand the issues or you are too evil to care about the fact that your bad choices places the lives of others at risk not to mention what it does to the economy, to the arts, to churches, and, and stopping concerts, that the way that we all want to get back to living, we're not back to yet because of the people who are not being vaccinated. Now, Valerie insists that she simply does not agree with her gray-haired father's analysis, but she couldn't really offer much of an apologetic for her friends who have refused to be vaccinated at this point. Now, I can applaud the fact that I have raised a daughter who is just so loving that she is willing to, to tell me that I have no right to label her friends as being either stupid or evil. I'm glad that she's a better person than I am, but honesty and a fearless orientation reality compels me to be rather less generous. At this point in history, knowing what we know, if you choose not to get a vaccine, you are choosing to take the side of the virus against innocent human beings. So, as a consequence, I simply don't have any unvaccinated friends in the United States because I just refuse to associate with people who are willing to give the virus a space in which to mutate and become more lethal, killing millions more people entirely 
unnecessarily, because this pandemic would be over now if it were not for all of these sociopaths exercising their freedom of choice to become a public menace. Now, that's just my opinion. It just so happens that I can back that up with scientific facts. We lost a good friend in our church last year, one of our founding members and one of my most enthusiastic supporters through all of the challenges that we faced in starting this church. Chris died in her third battle with cancer. And when the end became evident and she found the courage to talk about what kind of memorial service she hoped we might be able to pull together in the midst of a pandemic, her one demand to me was that I not say that there's no such thing as life after death because she didn't want her mother or her daughter to have to hear that and lose hope. I agreed not to say that explicitly, but I also assured her that I would not say the opposite. That is, at my age, I simply refuse to believe in Santa Claus or to pretend that I believe in Santa Claus. I can either be honest or I can be silent, but I will not do what most pastors do, which is to offer false hope that everyone in the room knows is a lie. But if you can stand it, I do have some more philosophical comfort to offer on this point. Life is precious specifically because we are mortal. If life were eternal, then one day would have no more meaning than another day, no more value, because life would just go on and on and on and on. What gives value to our existence is the very fact that life is inevitably in short supply. Because we don't live forever, we get to embrace every day as an opportunity in which to make a new friend, to discover a new joy, to learn something, to love someone more, or to have a new experience. It seems almost too modern to really believe it, but you can find in the musings of the second century Roman emperor and devoted Stoic philosopher, Marcus Aurelius, the rather disarmingly honest advice that we should not be afraid to die, but instead we should be afraid that we never begin to live. Now, he was known to be a persecutor of the early Christian church, but his personal meditations do not read like the monster that the early church described. I think that he simply saw Christianity as being a religion that was falling into the trap of making promises of eternal life that kept people from ever starting to live their lives fully. Accepting the fact of their mortality allows a person to make the most of the days that they do have. I know that some people think that I'm a real spoiler when I tell people that heaven and hell are just imaginary. But I believe, actually, that it is the church that has been the real spoiler. Scaring children with threats of hell. Infusing decent people with Puritan values that rob life of all joy. And, trickling, and tricking the elderly into trying to be religious enough to gain a ticket on the train to glory when, in fact, we all know that their last ride will be in the back of a hearse to Memorial Gardens. In the Gospel of John, Jesus tells his disciples that the truth will set you free. I believe that. I believe it will. The honest truth is liberating. But it has also been my experience that before it sets you free, it will make you very, very angry. The church and many of the religions of the world have lied to you. They have sold you ancient pipe dreams about eternal life. So go ahead and take a minute to be mad about that. You should be mad that you've been lied to. I'm just saying don't wallow in it too long. Because the truth is that life is short and you may yet have a lot of living to do. I think that the more valid spiritual teachings from Buddhism to Epicurean philosophy guide us towards a middle path in which we avoid the extremes, but we do not deny ourselves the joys of good food and drink, stimulating conversation, laughter, close friendships, and love. All balanced, of course, with meaningful work, 
and purposeful living and productivity. No matter how well you live, though, mortality is a one-way ticket. But as Alan Watts said, you do not sing a song simply to get to its end. We do not live our lives to come to a successful end at the pearly gates of eternity. We must live fully in every day. The joy is not in reaching a final destination. The joy is in the journey, or there is no joy at all. So pick a good traveling companion, wear comfortable shoes, and make sure that you're not always the one who pays for dinner. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.